So this begins our first section of a module dealing with the geopolitics and globalization of a pandemic. Uh, this lecture will serve as part one, which will introduce you to this module and then briefly go into the history of uh, pandemics and how we get to the current crisis and pandemic that we're facing now as a result of SARS-CoV-2, otherwise causing what is known as COVID-19. What this lecture tries to do for anyone who is living through this current crisis, in most occasions, if you're turning on your news station in your respective country, or if you open, let's say, the newspapers in your respective country, you are more or less getting the news from your respective national setting. And a lot of times that news you consume also happens to correspond to the political leanings you have. And of course, the political leanings of the media that gives you news and updates on COVID-19, of course, reflects kind of a prism in which this information is conveyed to you. What this lecture is trying to do is, or this entire module for that case, is to contextualize COVID-19. First, in terms of its history. Second, in terms of what political theories are there that can help us understand the greater global dynamics behind this outbreak. In other words, what I tried to do in this following article, zoom out and look at COVID-19's effect on global politics, or in other words, the geopolitics of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, so in this lecture, you'll see uh, references to articles that you can look up, as well as embedded URLs that my students will be able to access directly. But if you're watching this without the embedded URL, you could just simply Google the title. I start this lecture with going over the science and history. So this will be part one. Then we will go into, an, in another lecture, the political theory that could help us understand the global dynamics of the COVID-19 outbreak. From there, we are going to look at how this virus outbreak has affected two states on the national level. We're going to look at China, of course, the epicenter of the outbreak, and then the United States. From there, we are going to look at to regional levels. We will study the impact of the virus on the European level, particularly how it emerged in Italy and what impacts it had within the European continent or particularly within the system that is what we call the European Union. And then finally, we'll look at the impact and the transformation in a separate lecture on the Middle East regional system. How did the outbreak in uh, technically COVID-19 emerge first in the region, probably in the United Arab Emirates, we're not sure. But then how did the epidemic that broke out in Iran, how did this affect regional dynamics in this area that we call the Middle East? So to start, uh, this is a Super Bowl ad where, for the company Marmot. And I won't give away the ending of this ad, but let's just say, let's use this as a hypothetical example of humans interacting with other animals. And what does the Super Bowl ad represent? Well, it represents the possibility of any disease that this big mammal has, this mammal that we call a marmot, transferring into a human. Now, when I say a disease, this marmot can be infected with a uh, virus, bacteria, a parasite. That process of infecting, uh, when one animal infects another animal called a human being or homo sapiens, that's called zoonosis. And really the history of humanity has been determined as a result of zoonosis. Since humans started to settle in, uh, to cultivate agriculture, to raise animals in a process known as husbandry. One of the effects of that has been the greater incidence of zoonotic disease transmission. 
So let's look at the long history of this. I got these examples from a wonderful book I represent called the, uh, basically the Mosquito, the history, of course, particularly of malaria. But in this case, what does the opening try to remind us of? And then I'll bring in the mosquito into this. It's uh, believed that when humanity first domesticated the horse, in other words, rode the horse for transportation, used the horse as a vehicle to go into battle, that keeping the horses in close proximity to humans, the domestication of the horse, led to the transference of a virus that was originally in a horse into a human being. And the minute, the minute that transfer occurred and the virus found a good host in humans, the virus that causes the common cold has been with us since this time period. Okay. The problem is this, that virus that first made the jump from horses to human beings has been mutating for thousands of years. You might wonder why is there no cure for a common cold? Well, the problem is this, you, a, a, any kind of medicine has to anticipate how the common cold will mutate in a particular year, has to be then developed, then given to humans, and the kind of anticipation of its evolution. This task has proved more or less impossible. Anyway, from horses, we got the common cold. From chickens, we got a pox from them, a eh? chicken pox. In older adults, uh, you could be afflicted with shingles and various bird flus, okay? usually contracted by chickens interacting with wild bird life and that wild bird life transmitting the virus to the chicken. Uh, from pigs came influenza, and it's believed that the great flu of 1918 was a combination of wild, uh, a bird virus and an animal virus mutating within a pig and causing a very deadly pandemic. And from cattle came measles, one of the most deadliest viruses in history, smallpox, and a infectious bacteria known as tuberculosis. All those animals that were domesticated gave us not only milk, in the case of, let's say, cows, or eggs in the case of chickens, but also the viruses they contracted. Malaria also came about as a result of humans settling in areas, growing agriculture, uh, settling in places where uh, mosquitoes like to breed. Okay, and those mosquitoes picked up a parasite and started to inject humans with that parasite. That's the birth of malaria. And this is the long history of zoonotic transmissions. The moment we could plot this on a graph, okay, I can give you a more definite history of uh, basically what are collectively known as germs. Nonetheless, two virus, uh, two, sorry, two videos I recommend watching is a short history of humans and germs produced by NPR. If you're one of my students, go ahead and click the link. It should be embedded. And this second video called Darwinism and Viruses, which give you the overview, uh, basically in a very easy format to understand of the science behind germs. If we look at the video, uh, at this following diagram that is showing us the size of various germs, you don't see parasites. Parasites are respectively too big for comparative sake. But here you see where would the coronavirus fit in terms of size. It's more or less uh, around the size of the HIV virus. But I just, I'm trying to show you this so you compare what a virus looks like to something which is a much larger uh, organism, a bacteria. Now, I took this chart from the visual capitalist, uh, which is a very good history of the evolution of uh, epidemics that sometimes go global and become pandemics. Now, of course, if we're beginning with the Antonine Plague, there was no World Health Organization back then to declare it a pandemic, but nonetheless, uh, some of these diseases spread over multiple continents, so becoming what we could say a version of pre-modern pandemics. 
And if we look at this kind of historical evolution, when we talk about uh, the Antonine Plague or the Plague of Justinian, and keep in mind, we know that there were plagues. Now, when we say a plague, we are referring to any kind of outbreak, either caused by a virus or bacterium, that causes mass death. And the thing about the history of diseases is we have to infer based on primary sources left around the time. So if we're looking at the Antonine Plague, uh, historical documents left during the Roman Empire or the Plague of Justinian, historical documents left during the Byzantine Empire. And based on the symptoms they report, try to deduce what caused these pandemics. Now, in the case of the Antonine Plague or the Plague of Justinian, so then what you do is you look at the sources, and then we also have now, with the help of archaeology and the ability to kind of analyze uh, uh, genetic uh, DNA, uh, let's say human remains, so on and so forth, we have the ability to uh, also use, uh, do forensic, use forensic evidence to see what caused these outbreaks. But nonetheless, even though the cause of these various plagues as early as 165 uh, is debated, what we do know is they cause significant death. Okay. So with the Antonine Plague there, you see 5 million. The Plague of Justinian then jumps up to 30 to 50 million. Now, when you look at the numbers, you also have to keep in mind the world population was much smaller then. So when we look at 30 to 50 million, uh, breaking out during the plague of Justinian, and that just refers to the Byzantine emperor ruling at that time. You have to realize this is having a huge impact on the, at least the population of Eurasia, but still a significant impact on the world's population. And then we get to uh, epidemics such as the Japanese smallpox epidemic in the 700s, one million as a result of this virus. That's a large number for those days, particularly if we're talking about this uh, area in which the, in this case, we could call it an epidemic, a disease just really starting in one place and getting out of control. Uh, in our imagination, we, the Black Death figures prominently, and it's quite interesting with this recent outbreak of the coronavirus that you see a lot of articles coming out re-examining the Black Death or asking what does the Black Death teach us about this coronavirus. And in fact, I've written an article uh, doing the same. So the Black Death, if we look at the deaths there, 200 million. Now, if we're talking about the 1300s, that is a significant amount, 200 million. Why the large numbers? Well, we'll look at where the Black Death began. The bubonic plague, there are two zoonotic contenders. And again, you have to realize when we trace zoonosis, this isn't, you know, it's not, you know, we take educated guesses about where did the, where did the germ come from? And the two contenders is a giant gerbil, which I've never seen in my life, and a marmot. Again, never seen them. Uh, I tend to lean towards the marmot causing the bubonic plague. But nonetheless, what we do know is that the bacterium Yersinia pestis, most likely came from one of these mammals and then made the jump to humans, uh, either from a flea infecting, biting a marmot, then taking the bacteria infecting a rat, or either a flea infecting a human directly. But most likely fleas carried the virus, they would serve as what's called the vector of the Black Death. In other words, what is the, uh, what is the active element carrying the disease. So with malaria, the vector would be a mosquito. With coronavirus, we are the vectors from now, for now on. Okay, now with the Black Death, we believe it emerged in Central Asia, Eastern Central Asia, spread into China, and then traveled the trade routes that were established by the Mongols, uh, reached uh, the Crimean Peninsula. From the Crimean Peninsula, infected rats most likely went on boats that infected a ship heading towards the Italian Peninsula. And then on the Italian Peninsula, it reached uh, main, the mainland. And from what is the Italian Peninsula, went out throughout Europe. At the same time, along these trade routes, the Mongol trade routes also, also went through the Middle East, causing mass death and mayhem in the Middle East. Hence the large numbers, but you have to realize not all places were affected equally. Uh, because it first landed in Europe, I'm sorry, in Italy first, 
uh, Italy's population disproportionately suffered, let's say, than maybe more remote distant places in Northern Europe. But still, regardless, mass death throughout. Then we jump to 1520, where we have an outbreak of smallpox again. Then we have 17th century great plagues. One broke out outside of Milan, where you have the COVID outbreak right now. So unfortunately, back then, also Milan was a site of plagues. Then in the 18th century, you have the reemergence of plagues. Uh, then you have a series of outbreaks of cholera that collectively took about a million lives. Then you have what is called uh, the third plague around the 1850s breaking out. And then you'll see yellow fever, late 1800s, about up to 150,000 deaths. That's the result of, uh, that was where mosquitoes were the vectors of disease. And then if you look at the Spanish flu, okay, mistakenly called the Spanish flu because Spain didn't have a wartime censorship regime like in other countries such as the US or Great Britain during World War I. And the news broke of this disease in Spain, and from this point onwards, we call it the Spanish flu, even though it most definitely did not originate there, leading to 50 million deaths within the span of a year, uh, killing more people than World War I preceding it, and almost as much people as several years of World War II. Then we jump into the 21st century where we have small outbreaks in Asia, but I want you to look at where it says HIV AIDS, up to 35 million. Now here, I, I, I have to contest the date. It says 1981. 1981 is when we could say it struck the US, and then people started to look at what was causing, what was then thought and mistakenly called the gay cancer. But the origins probably go back to 1920s in Africa, in between Belgian and French colonies in Africa. That's probably where its uh, point of origin is, or where it began, and then slowly started to uh, spread over decades until finally it reached the U.S. Then we come to the 21st century, and if you notice, as the intensity of diseases breaking out, novel diseases, in other words, new diseases that made the transition from animals to humans, starts to intensify. It began, we could say, the 21st century, 2002, with severe acute respiratory syndrome. And technically, that is a coronavirus. So when we say a coronavirus, we're simply referring to the shape of a virus. The common cold is caused by a coronavirus. The first uh, SARS outbreak of the 21st century was caused by a coronavirus, most likely living within bats, bats that would infect a intermediate mammal, and that mammal would go on to affect a human. Then we have uh, the, a case of swine flu, originating from pigs. The uh, Ebola outbreak of 2014, this is not a new novel transition. Technically, Ebola made the transition much earlier, a few decades earlier, but really causing a global scare. Ebola emerged in 2014 that really had the world on edge about its potential to spread. And uh, finally, I forgot to mention before that, then you had Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. That again was a believed a bat that infected a camel. And from that, the camel virus, the virus in the camel transferred to a human. And here we are now with COVID-19. And that figure, I just took it a few weeks ago, but it's already very much out of date. Okay, and that is a long history of zoonotic transmissions. This is how we got to the present. And if we just look at the various um, outbreaks on kind of a comparative scale like this, okay? Yeah, remember with the smallpox, let's say, outbreak of 1520, what are we talking about? That is when Europeans brought smallpox in their boats across the Atlantic to both North and South America. Now, why did so many people die, particularly the Native Americans? Well, remember, where did these diseases come from? They came as a result of husbandry, keeping animals in close proximity to you. 
Remember, in North and South America, the Native Americans don't have a long history of domesticating any animals. They had never seen a horse, pig, chicken, camel. I don't think camels made the journey. Cows, uh, dogs, okay? So all these diseases that Eurasians and Africans had slowly built up immunities for over the millennia, the Native Americans didn't have that immunity. So if you look at 1520, what does the year 1520 represent? That's when Pizarro, I'm sorry, not Pizarro, Pizarro, uh, Cortez, Hernan Cortez, makes his march into Mexico. And by the time he lands into uh, Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire, his soldiers had probably brought a host of germs that are already starting to wipe out the Native American population. Spanish flu, we talked about coming as a result of World War I. Now, why are those numbers so high? It was as a result of the geopolitics of 1918. And what was happening geopolitically? Well, you had a war that's not called a world war for nothing. The entire globe was involved. And when we call it a world war, what are we talking about? The global movement of troops and war material that would not be moving normally during peacetime. And with the global circulation of troops and weapons, you also have the global circulation of a Spanish let's just call it a flu virus, traveling along with those troops, with those ships and sailors transporting this war material. And then, fortunately, with modern medicine, uh, the tolls are uh, lessening. So, of course, HIV is still with us. But fortunately, smallpox was more or less eradicated through a global vaccine vaccination program as of 1977. And here we are in terms of casualties. There we see COVID-19. And again, those numbers have gone up, but still nothing like the numbers of, let's say, yellow fever, for example. And here is just a timeline if you want to uh, compare casualties. Quite a grim uh, subject that we're studying here. Uh, the 1600s for was called the uh, 1629 to 1631, the Italian plague. So we could call COVID-19 the second Italian plague. And then bring us up to the present, that figure 11,400. That's the date as of March 20th, 2020. Okay. And just to, why does historical perspective, why is that important? Because if you look at images like this, what does this teach us? Now, there's always pitfalls when you do historical comparisons, but there are some constants that you do have to recognize. And one is the frontline workers, the health workers, during these wars against germs. They were important back in 1918. They are just as important now. And finally, the kind of scenes that we see now, these are all scenes from the 1918 to 1919 Spanish flu uh, pandemic. Now, why is history important? If we look at this article from the New York Times from veteran science writer Donald McNeil, it gives us a perspective. What measures are we taking that are medieval? Which ways are modern? And it brings us, let's look at the medieval ways, closing borders quarantining ships, penning terrified citizens up inside their poisoned cities. Those are medieval methods for dealing with an epidemic that has the potential to become a pandemic. Here, look what, uh, now if you look at this outfit, usually it's associated with the plague doctor during the great bubonic plague, but in fact, it came from a much later plague outbreak in Europe in the 1600s. Look at what Iran's deputy health minister said before he himself got infected with COVID-19. Why did Iran refuse to impose quarantines? Because they are pre-modern and ineffective. In other words, he's using the historical analogy to make his point. And again, if we look at this political cartoon, okay? So there you see the coronavirus uh, right there, the new millennial virus. Here you see the Spanish flu, and then here we see the Black Death. And 
coronavirus is absolutely right. My vision is not to kill per se, but to raise awareness or access, around access to public health. What is their pub called? The rat and bat. Because for coronavirus came from bats, uh, the Black Death, not like what I said, probably came from marmots, but also could have been transmitted by rats as well. Now, so if we look at the marmot, here it is. And when we talk about pre-modern public health, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about measures such as the quarantine, coming from the Italian word for 40 days, the time it was used to isolate sailors in islands off the coast of Venice. Lazaretto, or the Lazaretti, I guess, were the name of these islands. And sometimes the name we use for diseases tell us something about pre-modern medicine. Take the word malaria. What is that? That's just simply the Latin or Italian words for bad air. And what does that term reveal? Well, it reveals a pre-modern notion before germ theories that diseases were caused by bad air, literally, or with things that are called miasmas. Now, of course, what were other pre-modern attributions to disease? Either bad air, curses from a witch or a wizard, and of course, the wrath of God, pestilence and plague brought upon humanity for transgressing against the God, or the gods for that matter. Go to the SARS outbreak. This is a civet cat. Uh, so from the marmot, we go to the civet cat. And you have to realize marmots are eaten to this very day. The last case of somebody dying from the bubonic plague was just last year, where two Ka a Kazakh couple who believed marmot kidneys was good for your health, ate it and died before they could get to antibiotics. Fortunately, with a bacterium like Yersinia pestis, a back, uh, antibiotics will kill it. Not the case with uh, civet cats. We believe SARS was uh, broke out as a result of a bat infecting a civet cat, which went on to infect a human. And why are civet cats, in this case, kept in cages? Well, unfortunately, these animals are eaten. And then finally, the contender for the zoonotic transmitter of COVID-19 is this animal, the pangolin, a mix between an armadillo, uh, armadillo and a anteater. And it's believed to be the same process. A bat infected a pangolin, the virus mutated in the pangolin where it became in a position to infect humans. That's the current theory. I recommend watching this video, why do pandemics keep happening? Because the argument is pandemics keep happening and will keep on happening as we exploit our natural habitat. Now, when I say, okay, humanity has always exploited their natural habitat, but as we encroach more and more on environments in which more or less bats are isolated in, you are just simply increasing the odds of bats infecting animals that we trade or even infecting humans directly. And as we encroach more and more onto natural environments as a result of urbanization, mining, building new roads, we are going to have to expect that more zoonotic transmissions would occur. Well, and are, are, I mean, definitely they're gonna occur. And of course, this is a video that gives us an overview. But if we look at the live animal market workers, these, and now this is of course a sanitized version of a couple of pictures I'm gonna show you of where, what are the perfect breeding grounds for zoonotic, zoonotic transmission. If you look here, what do we have? We have animals in cages, stressed, Already their immune systems are weak, so they're very much susceptible to catching viruses. And of course from there, when these animals are then handled or butchered like this, okay, of course you give the virus infecting the animals a very easy opportunity to jump into that human. Look at his nose, mouth and eyes. A little blood spurts into the eyes, he could easily breathe in the virus, he might take his gloves and touch his face. And there you have the perfect spread of a virus in a wet market. 
Now I know some of these images might look disgusting. And here, of course, here's the Wuhan wet market being closed down with a great salamander being rounded up because uh, it could be a means of transmission. But then again, we don't know what our favorite, let's say, deli or fast food restaurant looks behind the kitchen. So I mean, whether you could easily have a zoonotic transmission there, salmonella poisoning, E. coli, uh, or uh, poisoning from these kind of markets. OK, which now ends our lecture on the history and the science of how COVID-19 broke out. In our next lecture, we're going to be looking at what does political theories tell us about a pandemic. Thank you.